Okay, well, think about this. You wake up in the morning, most people, your, your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced this moment. It's the memory bank of everything you know. It's the known self. People wake up in the morning, they start thinking about their problems. 90% of the people do this. Those problems are memories that are etched in their brain. They're connected to certain people and certain objects and things at certain times and places. If they believe their thoughts have something to do with their future, the moment they're remembering their past, they're thinking in the past. Every one of those problems has an emotion associated with them. So then all of a sudden they start feeling unhappy. Well, thoughts are the vocabulary of the brain. Feelings are the vocabulary of your body. How you think and how you feel creates a state of being. So most people start their day with their entire state of being in the familiar past. Now when they're familiar past, they're going to crave the predictable future because they want to stay in the known. Yeah. The unknown, oof, that's just, they'd rather hang on to their suffering and their pain than take a chance in possibility. In fact, they don't even know they're suffering. They just think it's how they normally feel until they decide to begin to change. So when we're studying spontaneous remissions, people kind of stumbled on this by, by trusting something innate in them, something intuitive in them. Not so mechanical, but just like, God, if I had another shot at life, how would I think? How would I act? How would I feel? Who would I become? Who will I be? And they began to change by thought alone. The last thing they had in common, which was really incredible, is that when they closed their eyes and began to image who they wanted to be when they opened their eyes, they lost track of time and space. They, when they opened their eyes, they thought it was 20 minutes later, it was an hour later. Because the frontal lobe, that's the creative center of the brain, began to lower the volume to the circuits in the brain where you process space and time. Now your inner world becomes more real than your outer world, and now all of a sudden you're laying strong footprints biologically in the brain and body. So when I saw what these commonalities were, the next thing I said was, well, hell, if it worked on sick people, could it work on well people? Can we help people to change that way? And if it worked on sick people, it should work again on sick people. So that kind of started the whole process. And then when it started working, then we started doing all these measurements to kind of demystify the process. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody's excluded from this. Nobody's excluded. Tra trauma is the stronger the emotional reaction you have to whatever's causing it. The more altered you feel inside of you, the more you pay attention to what's causing it. And the brain holds the image and freezes it and takes a picture. Yep. And now you emboss that neurologically in the brain. Yep. Now, people will think neurologically within those circuits and feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so then you'll ask them, why are you this way? And they'll say, I'm this way because of this event, which means I haven't been able to change since that event, even though it's 20 years ago. And so every time they tell the story of that event, they're refiring and rewiring and producing more of the emotions to reaffirm the fact that they are who they are, excusing themselves from changing. Now, here's the crazy part. The latest research on memory says that 50% of what we talk about in our past isn't even the truth. So people are reliving a miserable life they never even had. They embellish it just so they could reaffirm the emotions that they feel, so that it, it, it keeps them as the same person. Uh, but this wasn't just that. This was like, okay, let's see if we can take this body's innate capacity to heal to the next level. Now, fast forward to today. We have blind people seeing. We have deaf people hearing. We have tumors that are on people's thyroids or in their brain, 50 brain tumors, one guy. There's no evidence of the disease in these people because they're not that person anymore longer. The disease exists in somebody else. They became a different persona. So, so then evidence becoming the loudest voice. We have the scientific evidence that you can strengthen your immune system. You can signal new genes. You can change your genetic future. You can create more brain and heart coherence. You know, we have all the scientific data to show what's possible. Change your neurotransmitters, all that. And we also have evidence and testimony like, oh my God, somebody standing on the stage with stage four cancer who weeks before was given the death sentence that has no evidence of cancer. Now, if you're in the audience of a thousand people and you're listening to someone tell that story and you, she doesn't look like a movie star, she just looks like a normal person, you're going to start scratching your head and start saying, if she can do it, I can do it too. And numerous people in the audience are like, I'm in. Now you help me. Now I can do it. And it's not anything that she's telling them to do. 
the, the story, allegory, is, is the greatest way people begin to learn. So evidence becomes the loudest voice because yeah. all of a sudden, if you can do it, then I can do it. And so you're not doing it to, to outshine somebody. You're, do, you're up there to say, I did this and so can you. Now, now people are starting to take their power back and say, whether they're treating or not, I'm going to try this out. And that's just your body. Never mind the, the incredible opportunities you can create in your life when you change how you think and feel. Uh, I was in Sydney uh, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and I'm signing books at the end of this event for my publisher. And I can't believe how many people are coming up saying, my oncologist told me to come uh, to this event. Not once, not twice, not three times, numerous times. Because... Uh, Again, this is not just some whales in space thing. This is evidence-based. And, and so evidence becomes the loudest voice because if your cousin's best friend healed from uh, Graves' disease or Hashimoto's syndrome or a brain injury or whatever, you're going to want to know like, what happened. So 15 years ago, I had to work really hard to get people to just nod their head and just go, yeah, now information is the door because yeah. of technology, because of podcasts like this. People are exposed to information. You don't need a doctor to get this information. You yeah. don't need a, a priest or an authority. You can, yeah. a teacher, you can access information. And with information comes awareness. So awareness is consciousness. And so you're less unconscious when you gain information. So then the next practical question is, and I'm a pragmatist, but what are you going to do with it? So when you take that philosophical, theoretical information, you apply it, you personalize it, you demonstrate it. If you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, you can get your actions equal to your thoughts. Your mind and body working together, you're going to have a new experience. Experience then enriches circuitry in the brain. Learning creates circuitry, but experience enriches it. The end product of an experience is an emotion. Now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. Now, all of a sudden now, you're embodying the truth of that philosophy. No one can take that away from you. And so then if you've done it once, you should be able to do it again. And so then our research shows that when you start practicing this and you can create brain coherence, and we have so many great scans of people of all ages, of all colors, of all sizes, all shapes, all diets, doesn't matter. Yeah. And they know how to create heart coherence. Wow, when, they, when they're able, when they're able to open their heart again and feel an elevated emotion, they're going to start liking that a lot more than resentment or anger. So then crossing that river, though, from the old self to the new self is where, where, where greatness is born. This is where you're out of the bleachers and you're on the field. And that place of uncertainty, that place of unknown, is the perfect place to create in. So our research shows then that if you're able to just practice, just practice, You'll get better at it over time. And now more and more people are doing it so quickly. We have universities looking at our data saying, we don't know what you're doing there, but people can change their brain states in like four seconds. Yeah. That's unheard of. Five seconds. How does it? Well, they just know how to do it. Why? Because we've done it enough times with them. So now they know how to get beyond themselves. And if you're going to create anything new, you got to get beyond you in order to do that. Because if you're creating from your old self, nothing's going to change, right? So, so teaching people that, that formula and demystifying the process and showing that we have the science to actually back it, then more and more people begin to trust in the process more. And throw in a great miracle or two here and there, and then that's it. Yeah. And then then it just starts starts happening magic and then i can't tell you how many emails or texts my my staff send me someone who said yeah he had leukemia for, we just got one the other day Le leukemia for 10 years 25 year old kid no leukemia doctors can't believe it they want to study him what what took place uh, so so now every day there's one that's just another fabulous incredible story that uh, that uh, there's a movement yeah, and it's, it's a healthy movement.